when I go to a place to speak, there are different types of organizations that bring me in. Um, not every metropolitan area has a smart growth organization. Uh, certainly not areas of, of this size. And um, there's, it's great that you have one, but we understand why you have one. Because there's so much to protect. And the beauty and the, not, not just the beauty and the, the, you know, the tourism surrounding your open space, but you, it's your business. I mean, your open space, your land is your business. And so recognizing that, um, it makes a lot of sense that, that you have an organization like this one here. Um, I'm hoping that I can help. Um, you've got a really nicely shaped um, region. Because of your urban growth boundary, and I realized uh, that the, the terminology that you use in urban services boundary is much smarter. I think it's a much smarter way to describe it because, in fact, it makes you realize that, uh, that the issue is the cost and the unsustainability of, of ever expanding your services outward. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that, that ex-urban development does not pay for itself, and the amount of wires and pipes and other stuff that you have to get out there per house is just so much greater. And um, it's a smart thing for a city to do, to just say, wait, it doesn't make sense for us to keep making the bad investment of growing ever larger, particularly when you have all that space left over that hasn't been used. Now, Brittany told me that it's been 27 years since you expanded the boundary. Guess when I was last here? I did the math. 27 years ago. <laughs> I was here in, ni in 96, uh, speaking at, at, at the UK, and um, you've managed to hold the boundary that whole time. It would be a pity if my return didn't re... re <laughs> didn't... Yeah, it'd be a pity if my return did not get you another 27 years. So let's work on that. Um, and then the mention that unlike many places like Portland, where what Portland, Oregon, where it was documented that the urban growth boundary made housing more expensive, careful studies here have shown that that's not been the case. So that's a really important thing to say. Um, and then the triple L, very important in this discussion. Lots of land left. So you can use that land. And also, there's a lot of stuff in the city, not vacant land. But by the way, looking at your, studying your city um, from the air, you've got some really big parking lots, right? <laughs> you have this one by the convention center. And I, th I thought I'd seen it all, and then I saw this one. <laughs> but actually, when it comes to, to making, as I'm going to explain, when it comes to making walkable community, your, your biggest opportunity for that, of course, the closer you get to the center of town, the easier it is to provide a more walkable environment. And um, the secret for that is, is here. And the idea that, yes, the parking's profitable, uh, on it's particularly the other lot on game day, right? You're making a, they're making a lot of money off of that parking. But, but a lot of great new urbanist projects, a lot of great new urban dense walkable projects become that way by structuring surface parking and that frees up four-fifths of the land, right? You do a five-story parking deck, all of a sudden, You've got four-fifths of the land available. For these sites, particularly this one that's so close to the heart of your downtown, um, I think it makes sense to replace this lot with a structure, and then you're going to have a ton of space available for, for maybe your next great, I'm, I'm jumping to the conclusion, maybe your next great urban neighborhood could be on this parking lot, uh, which is so well located. But anyway, I, I think I'm going to transition from smart growth to walkability because I've stopped telling the story through a smart growth lens. The kind of work that, that my colleagues and I do, my mentors, Andre Stwani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg did, um, it's been called a lot of things. Technically, I think you might call it best practices in city planning. But we called it traditional town planning when we started because we were returning to traditional principles of how you make a town as opposed to suburban sprawl. Um, we called it the new urbanism. We still do. Um, we've, we we co-opted the smart growth label when that came <laughs> along and started calling it smart growth. Um, but what I've realized is the best way, and forgive me, I'm not suggesting you change your, you know, the, the subtitle of your organization, but the best way to explain, to understand, to sell the concepts of good planning that I'll be sharing with you tonight is through the lens of walkability. And, and, and interestingly, when it comes to smart growth, essentially, you have a choice to point your region in two different directions. You are either a region that supports walking, biking, and transit, which all support each other, or you're a region that supports driving, 
which actually undermines the other three. And I think it's important to understand that, that those are the two choices. And the, the, the automotive solution, while we'll all keep having cars and using cars, the automotive focus solution is by its very nature an anti-smart growth solution because what the, what the automobile does is it disperses. That's what, you know, other forms of transportation are nodal. The, you know, trains are nodal, boats and airplanes, they're nodal. They land you in a specific place and then that place becomes, uh, you know, a, a place of energy and, and economy. When the car showed up, the whole landscape became equivalent. Anywhere you could lay a thin strip of asphalt became just as valuable as anywhere else, right? So the car is a dispersion tool. Cities are concentration tools. They don't really support each other. And so a smart growth solution is to say, what's the alternative to the automotive dependent lifestyle? And that's a lifestyle of walking, biking, transit, and anything else you can think of that's basically not being in your own pod. Whether that pod is autonomous or not, electric or not, right? That's, that's uh, irrelevant. So um, moving on to the walkable city, I'm going to be taking you through the structure of that book, which is basically, actually I'm skipping the first part of the book, which is why walkability is so important. And there's so many powerful health arguments and wealth arguments and environmental arguments for making more walkable cities. Most audiences these days, at least if they, if they show up to see me, they already get it, right? They already understand those arguments, they've already bought, they've already drunk that Kool-Aid. <laughs> so, uh, rather than waste time, my limited time on convincing you uh, why it's important to be walkable, I'm going to talk about what I call my, my general theory of walkability. And my general theory of walkability says, going back, um, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek, but it is a theory, which means it's a hypothesis that we keep refining over time as we learn more things through, through studying it. Um, in America, particularly, in which driving is so cheap and so easy, and it's heavily subsidized, about $9 to the dollar, each dollar we spend. Um, and the car is typically sitting there in the driveway between you and everything. And actually, if you have a car, the smart thing to do economically, because the fixed costs are so great and the, the um, variable costs are so small, the smart thing to do is to drive it all the time. So if you, in that environment, how do you get people to walk? And the answer is the walk has to be as good as the drive. And if the walk is going to be as good as the drive, it has to do four things simultaneously. It needs to be useful, it needs to be safe, it needs to be comfortable, and it needs to be, I'm going to point now when I click, it needs to be comfortable, it needs to be interesting. So these are the four categories I'm going to march you through uh, tonight. And I've got to speed up, so let's go faster. The useful walk, it's a lesson I learned from my mentors, Andres and Liz. Andres used to give this talk called The Story of Planning where he described how in the, eight, in the 19th century people were choking on the soot from the dark satanic mills and the planners uh, said, hey, let's move the housing away from the factories. And when they did, the lifespans increased immediately and dramatically and the planners were hailed as heroes and they've been trying to repeat that experience ever since. So you have this onset of what's called Euclidean zoning, the separation of the landscape into large areas of single use. Um, I was an art history major. They said that wasn't the most lucrative choice. But I can tell you, you, when you're planning, you don't want a Rothko, right? You don't want a Rothko. He was the blob painter. You want a Seurat. Seurat was the pointillist, right? The smaller the, each use, the finer grain of uses. And this is not a zoning map. This is actually just the uses in Manhattan. Um, and you, even the red is vertically mixed use. So the, so the first thing is you have to throw out, in areas you want to be walkable, you have to throw out your Euclidean zoning. But that gets me into kind of the fundamental new urbanist argument. Those of you who have suburban nation um, have heard this before. But there's basically only two ways to build communities. Actually, there's a thousand ways to make a city, but there's only two ways that we've tested by the thousands. And that's the traditional neighborhood and suburban sprawl. The traditional neighborhood is defined as being compact and mixed use, diverse, and walkable. Um, it evolved naturally in response to man's needs. This is Newburyport. Massachusetts near where I was, uh, near where I live now and where I grew up. Um, it evolved naturally, it wasn't invented. And I think people now, I don't know if you've studied Naom and Saudi Arabia and other things that are happening, people think they can invent what a city is. In fact, cities grew up alongside humans uh, and they have a spooky wisdom we don't fully understand. But one of the things that evolved was the traditional neighborhood. Um, not an evolution, but an invention was suburban sprawl, which is defined as the opposite. It's clearly not compact, it's not diverse, 
you know, whole images like this show just one land use housing. Um, and it's not walkable because if you look here, there's lots of streets, but most of them just double back or dead end. And so very few streets actually connect. And the streets that do connect then have to handle all the traffic of the city and they become overburdened. We call them traffic sewers. And in fact, look at the, there's no, um, there's no addresses on these streets. The houses turn their backs because they're so, they're so uh, toxic. Um, so clearly not walkable. And it's fun to break sprawl down into its constituent parts, the places where you only live, where you only work, where you uh, only shop. Schools get bigger and bigger and further away. We consolidate schools, which means they're harder to get to and further from us. Uh, we consolidate our play fields so that the child in this house actually has a mile and a half walk, which he'll never take because it looks like this, <laughs> to get to the play field outside the house. And this idea is, it seems preposterous when I describe it this way, but of course, if you presume that every trip involves a car, then these sort of decisions happen every day. And that's what we have to work to avoid. Um, the part that we forgot to count, you know, if you separate everything from everything else, reconnect it only with automotive infrastructure, then your highway system becomes a commuting system, it becomes a recreation system, it becomes what you need uh, to do everything. So I always tell people it's a two-part deal. You know, for many people, this is still the American dream, um, the isolated house with nothing but other houses. But uh, with this dream comes this nightmare, and you can't have one without the other. And often to absurd extremes, the amount that we invest in our horizontal infrastructure and, and rob from our budgets for vertical infrastructure just so that you never have to wait more than one cycle at a light. Because, of course, the landscape is so mind-numbingly horrible that if it's two cycles, you want to shoot yourself. And, um, so the experience can be quite annoying. Uh, this is actually in, in Massachusetts, <laughs> believe it or not, near where I live. Um, this is not Photoshop. Walter, Walter Kulash took this slide in Florida. Um, but we all know it's very stressful on families. The longer, the longer your commute, the more likely you are to be divorced. It's actually true. Um, and then I got this slide 20 years ago. You've probably seen it. But this, I got this from an epidemiologist um, who said, you know, the reason why we have the first generation of Americans who are expect, and this was, now we're on our second generation, because this is 20 years ago. But 20 years ago, they told us that we have the first generation of Americans who are expected to live shorter lives than their parents because we've engineered out of our lives the, the useful walk. So the idea that it seems perfectly natural to drive, to park, to take the escalator, to the gym, to get on the treadmill, to walk, is why we're in this unhealthy circumstance. So, you know, driving can be a real dra drag. Walking can be even worse. Um, and the rest of my talk is really about our existing communities and, and particularly yours. Um, but as you think about building new communities, this is, the, this is the image I want you to sear into your retinas. Because, I mean, this is the Im really important distinction between these two models. Each one is, is internally consistent and self-supporting, but one of them is actually better for people, and the other one is better for cars, except wait, it's worse for cars. Because here there's 21 ways to get from one corner to the other corner, and here there's actually only one path from anything to anything else, and actually if you have a uh, engine fire on your, on your arterial or on your collector street, the whole city shuts down for an afternoon, right? So it, it's, it's a question of not what your uses are, they're all there, how big are they? How far apart are they from each other? And um, uh, what's the road network? Is it, is it dendritic branching sprawl or is it a porous small block network? So when you look at your existing cities now, and particularly your downtown cores, um, you think about the useful walk and you say, how useful is my walk? And you look at all the uses that are there and ask what use is missing or underrepresented. And almost always in our downtown cores, particularly because so many of them were CBDs and there was no desire to keep housing in them, most of them are shy on housing. And it's by putting more housing into our downtown cores that cities are becoming, are becoming walkable again in the most intense ways. Jane Jacobs was talking about Wall Street in the 1960s 
And she said, you know, 400,000 people come to Wall Street every, every day to work. Why isn't there one great restaurant or one great gym on Wall Street? And the answer is what she called time spread. A great restaurant or a great gym needs a lunchtime crowd and a nighttime crowd. So when you bring the housing back, everything else kicks in and you get like a so much better downtown. And it's a kind of a, a you know, positive circle that gets better, a virtuous circle. You can't rely on bringing people downtown. You have to put them there, in other words, housing downtown. And cities that want to become more walkable, that want to be more successful, are actually uh, subsidizing, yes, yeah, subsidizing developers, putting housing in their downtown. In Des Moines, Iowa, that meant uh, they went from 2,500 units to 10,000 units um, over 20 years. Uh, they had a 10-year tax abatement, and they had 10 years of tax increment financing on top of that to make it happen. And, and I, I think it's, it's a good investment. I heard about $20 million, $28 million floating around uh, surplus. Um, I have all kinds of ideas for that money. <laughs> um, another important thing in housing is the granny flat, which is a wonderful way to increase density uh, with a light touch. Uh, you have a granny flats ordinance, but I've heard it's actually called a five granny flats ordinance because you've gotten exactly five granny flats since you passed this ordinance because it has too many restrictions in it. And what happened in California, but here's what I interrupt to say, do you know why I love my job so much? Because I get to show up and say all these things I want to say and then I leave. <laughs> and so some of you are not going to like some of the things I say tonight, but then I won't be here. So um, <laughs> your, your, your granny flats ordinance is, is doesn't, it doesn't actually allow freestanding buildings. Your granny flats have to be attached, I've never heard of such a thing, have to be attached to the homes that, that they're with. That's not a granny flat. Uh, this is a granny flat. It's above or a garage, or it's sitting on its own bottom in your yard. Um, it's the most wonderful way to add housing to neighborhoods. It's naturally supervised. It's small scale. It really doesn't change the way the neighborhood works. Um, and in my book, Walkable City Rules, I talk about what happened in California, where the state uh, stepped in, outlawed all the local municipalities' ordinances, and said, we're going to give you a better one, a more lax one, that's now allowed statewide. And uh, LA went from 80 building permit applications in 2016, uh, in 2016 to 2,000 in 2017 when these new rules kicked in. And now fully like one, one out of every 10 housing, house being built in California right now is a granny flat. So uh, a, a looser ordinance will allow that to happen here and there's really no downside uh, to that. Um, then the final part of the useful walk, so we're finishing up this first category, of course, is transit. And what matters isn't just transit, but, but frequent transit. And I think it's important to distinguish your frequent transit system from your not frequent transit system. Understand that it needs to coordinate with land use. And rule 20 from walkable city rules is coordinate transit and land use. And it talks about how in Vancouver, their long range transit plan actually links frequent service to high residential density. So your, your transportation department should have a frequent service map or your transit agency. Uh, and your planning department should have a high density housing map and they should pass that map back and forth and make sure that it's coordinated because that's where you can have the attainable housing. And um, it was mentioned that you're, you're typically paying 24% of your income on transportation here. Um, poor people in the US are paying about 40% of their income on transportation. An affordable house that requires you, or let's say home, because affordability probably means apartments, an affordable home that, that is in a place that requires you to drive a car is not really affordable. And it's important that you need to provide affordable lifestyles, not just affordable, cheap housing, if you want someone to have a successful life. So um, that was the first category. The category we're gonna spend most of our time is category number two, the safe walk, for a number of reasons, but principally because it comes down to our streets and the streets, more or less, are controlled by the city. And so of these four categories, it's the one that can be changed the fastest. And I went from doing a lot of 20-year plans, most planner plans are 20-year plans. Um, nowadays, I do a lot more, just in order to have, have more impact, I do a lot more what I call walkability studies. And walkability studies for cities look principally at the streets that the cities control and say, how can we change these now so that actually in three, four years, before, before you face another election, Mayor, how can we 
uh, have more people walking and biking in your downtown. And it comes down to the streets. The other three categories, the useful walk, the comfortable walk, and the interesting walk, are, are pretty much about the private stuff that lines the streets, which governments can influence with zoning and with, with investment, but only over time. But streets can be fixed right away. Now, we're in a crisis mode here. This is the, the pedestrian deaths since uh, 1990, and down, it, it, it hit bottom around uh, 2008, I believe, and it keeps going up and keeps going up. It's been an 82% rise in pedestrian deaths over the last 14 years, and I believe the data from 2022 puts us at 100% rise since 2022. Um, the number of collisions by bike or walking are only 14%, but they comprise about half of the uh, people killed for obvious reasons. There's this wonderful book. Has anyone read this book, Right of Way? Number of People by Angie Schmidt. Um, there's several reasons for this, this very um, uh, problematic trend. The first is the suburbanization of poverty. A lot of people now, you know, poor people used to live in the cities and rich people lived out in the country or the suburbs. A lot of poor people now are being pushed out to the suburbs, right? And a lot of our suburbs have been designed around the mandate of driving, yet these people don't have cars. A lot of them don't have cars. So you have people walking in places where people were never imagined walking. And so that's contributing a lot to the death toll. The biggest contributor is, is uh, pickup trucks and SUVs. And um, it's clear, you know, the, the data are, are overwhelming. You know, when you're hit by an SUV, you end up under it, and you get hit a lot harder and a lot higher. And, uh, you know, we, we used to sell, almost, you know, 30 years ago, there were almost no SUVs on the road. Now SUVs dominate the car sales. Most cars have these high fronts. They go faster. They're harder to stop. There's not much we can do about that. But we can change the design of our streets so that people are driving a little bit slower. The greatest factor in any kind of crash, any kind of vehicle, the greatest factor in the damage that crash causes is the speed of the vehicle. It's a logarithmic function. A car going 35 miles an hour is about 10 times as likely to kill you as a car going 25 miles an hour. And that, that range from 25 to 35 miles an hour is the speed which people are typically driving in our urban streets. What are the details that cause them to go 25 or even 20, in which almost no one gets killed, versus 30 or 35 miles an hour? So we're going to march through some of those. The first one's kind of hard to fix, but it's important, it's interesting to note that block size, small block size, is an amazing contributor to pedestrian safety. This is Portland, Oregon, famously walkable, famously 200-foot blocks. There's actually a measurement at the bottom of these slides. Um, this is Salt Lake City, famously not so walkable, famously 600-foot blocks. Um, this is my wife and one of my sons crossing a street in Salt Lake City where they give you flags and buckets to wave as you cross so that no one mows you down. Um, here they are side by side. Uh, a 200-foot block city can basically be a two-lane city, whereas a 600-foot block city in America is typically a six-lane city, and people drive a lot faster. These are um, 24 different California cities. If you look uh, two-thirds of the way down, when you double the average block size, the number of non-highway fatal crashes almost quadruples. So you want small blocks. Here's your downtown. And luckily, you were developed initially at the right, in the right era, and your blocks are pretty darn small. Here you are next to Portland. Remember, Portland's pretty much the best. So you're looking quite good in your downtown core and in the surrounding areas. This is what we call good bones. So your downtown has every opportunity to be, more, to be walkable. I'd say more walkable than it is, because I'd say right now it is not all that walkable. Uh, of course, you have other parts, as does every city, near downtown, surrounding downtown, that are bad bones. These areas, you can do a lot to make them safer, and a lot of the work that we designers do is just to bring s more safety into these deadly areas where the death toll from cars is much higher. Um, but it'll never be walkable because it has the wrong bone structure. It's not possible, except for whole wholesale replacement, to make these areas places where people will make the choice to walk. But within your good bones, you have some interesting uh, anomalies. I understand this was the 
you had railroad tracks, and MLK was the one street that ran over those railroad tracks. This is a real seam in your downtown. The main lesson here is any opportunity you have to make blocks smaller, you should do that. Any opportunity you have, like hospitals and universities, asking you to consolidate blocks, you should probably avoid that. Because small blocks are part of a system uh, that's more walkable, <laughs> question mark. That was first. Second is the number of lanes. No one's, driving, no one's walking here, but um, people are walking here. Um, how many lanes do you have? Clearly, the wider a street is, the more lanes it has, the longer it takes to cross, the more it looks like a highway, the faster cars go. Uh, do we have any lanes we don't need? And the, the reason we often have um, extra lanes that we end up needing due to congestion is because of this fundamental under misunderstanding that underlies the profession of traffic planning in the US. Um, this is ideal traffic planning. The yellow line is the traffic. The purple is the capacity. <clears throat> when, the capacity when, the, when the traffic outpaces the capacity, you get congestion. The theory is that you widen the street, and of course, the congestion goes away, which in the history of street widenings has never happened, ever. Um, we've been talking about this for 25 years. I imagine you've all heard about this before. Induced demand, it's called. Um, you probably don't know all about it. Uh, I'm still learning. This is the study that was presented at the Paris School of Economics, describing it. It's very straightforward. <laughs> Actually, I have no idea what this means, but I know what this, I know what this means and what all the data show, which is that any new capacity you add within uh, four years is taken up entirely by new trips, and is immediately typically taken up by 40% taken up by new trips, except when it's, in, when in some cases, it's 100% taken up by new trips right away. But this is more the typical curve, curve, excuse me. You know, the effort is completed, and then four years later, the congestion reaches pre-construction levels and then surpasses, and we have that story over and over again. Why? Why can't we reduce traffic by adding lanes. And this applies to city streets where parking is removed from the curb and lanes are added, or sidewalks are narrowed or lanes are, and lanes are added, or of course highways where we build new highways or we widen highways. Can anyone answer this question? In congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is, I'll give you a hint, the answer is in that sentence. Congestion. In our lives, the only way we really pay for our driving, because it's so subsidized, is by being stuck in traffic. It's the time cost that keeps us from driving. And so when you remove the impediment, then you're gonna drive more. So this is an equilibrium. You may not like it, but you do it. You go out there and you join those people, and you're in your 20 minute rush hour, because that's a choice you're making, right? And by the way, if you, if you have more lanes in your city, your rush hour will, will shorten a little. And if you have fewer lanes, your rush hour will lengthen a little, but it'll be exactly the same amount of congestion. Um, but we have story after story about widenings, uh, you know, not, not doing their jobs. Um, and then this is a really nice quote. Any reasonable increase in street capacity will not reduce the density of traffic for the places made available will be taken by those drivers who may be said to be on the margin of convenience. 1925, <laughs> 98 years ago. <laughs> Can you imagine? So, cities that invest, in, and I know that you're not about to do this, so that's great. In Virginia on I-95, they're about to do this. I, I, I didn't hear there were any widenings or new highways planned right here, am I right? Um, what, you, what you purchase when you widen your streets is more time in traffic, that's what you purchase. So, um, I wanted to point out this excellent study and I've had no interaction with your city planning department. Are, is anyone present from the city planning department? Well, they're the people who need to be here the least because they get it. So you have, this, you have a number of great studies that came out of city planning. Um, in the Imagine Nicholsville Road study, they asked people, what are your, you know, what are you, how would you describe Nicholsville Road? And if you look at the cloud, the word cloud, busy, mess, congested traffic. And if you say, what do you want out of Nicholsville Road? Free-flowing, safe, smooth, easy. Now, the safe is number two. I should say it looks tied. It looks to be tied with, with free-flowing. So maybe we can put it to the top. But if you ask people what they want, they want free-flowing, smooth, and easy. 
We have to make sure that that public sentiment doesn't turn into a sentiment to widen it because we know that won't, that won't get us there. Then I want to call your attention, though, to some, now that I've acknowledged the excellence of this product, I want to call attention to some things that matter to me on this page. One is that there are 4,513 crashes on this street in three years. That's a crash every six hours. That's incredible. So safety is a real, is a real issue. I also want to point out that it has this chart that if you haven't seen it before, is called a level of service chart. And this is the most dangerous thing in American planning today. Because you think it's a report card, and A is, a good, and a is good and B is worse and C, eh. It does say here, wisely, that in urban settings, LOSD or better is desirable. But that needs fixing. In an urban setting, if you have an LOS A or B, you have a failed city. LOS could stand for le uh, lack of success, I like to say. Any place you admire, any place you go to walk around, want to go shop, hang out, stay, stay there on holiday, I guarantee you the level of service is, is, is C or probably D. So I wouldn't say D is desirable, I'd say D is necessary in a place where you want people to enjoy. Another thing I want to point out is, what do you see on this chart? You see three numbers. 15,000 cars a day, 16,000 cars a day, and 17,000 cars a day. And this is the 10-year um, and 20-year forecast. How are those forecasts working out for you? Because every place I've tried to do work, I've had to widen streets in anticipation, not every place, many places I've done work, I've had to widen streets in anticipation of a forecast which said it was growing 1.5% every single year. Well, if you look at it, uh, you know, this is COVID. This is, this is this is post, this is COVID, this is Zoom. This is Zoom. And we're actually pretty much where we were in 2004. So there'll be unpredictable things, but the one thing you don't want to do is widen your streets in anticipation of some growth that may or may not happen because, as we've just learned, it invites the driving, right? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we have to be very careful about that. The solution, of course, is multimodal. The solution, as in this study, is to have a bus lane that can zip down the center dedicated while the cars, people can choose to stay in your car and be stuck in traffic, but the bus will, will have the center lane. That's really a, gr a great plan. But just generally in this concept of the number of lanes, you look at streets like Broadway, which are so, so large, and uh, this is East Main, and you just look at the numbers and you say, um, do we really need all those lanes? And we always find streets in cities actually that have more lanes than they need even if you accept the amount of traffic that they're currently enjoying. Um, my best example to show you is in Oklahoma City where they were named the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country. <laughs> and the mayor called me in and said, what do we do? And I said, let's do a walkability study. And he said, what's that? And I said, I'm not sure. Let's figure it out. <laughs> and it was my first one. And we looked. We know. Anyone will tell you. Any engineer will tell you that a two-lane street can handle 10,000 cars per day. And these were four to six lane streets in the downtown city core. Four to six lanes carrying two lanes of traffic. Now you don't have many of these, but I, I guarantee you, you have a few. And in the, in the new plan, they were gonna keep them that, that wide. So I said, you have a real mismatch there and, uh, between lanes and travel. And the mayor was building, the, the, this tower was being built in the center of Oklahoma City generating $200 million in tax revenue, and we decided, they decided to re basically rebuild every downtown street. We got rid of their one-way system. It's all two-way now. Um, I was in charge of the curb-to-curb -curb designs. And, uh, whoops, yeah, we'll skip that. So a typical street went from four lanes to two lanes. Here it is under construction. Um, this street became this street. These are straight ahead streets, nothing fancy about them, but this street became this street. And uh, about 20 different streets were remade. I always say this is what you do when you have money. They rebuilt, right? They rebuilt their whole downtown core. Most cities I say, don't rebuild, restripe. Because you can, you can restripe a whole downtown for the cost of rebuilding a couple streets. So I have other, project, other projects I'll show you where that's all that we did. Um, but Oklahoma City is now much more walkable. And notice now, we, I, I mentioned 
10,000 cars per day can be a two-lane street. Well, here, Upper Street, and what's the other one next to Upper? Limestone. They're well below 10,000 cars per day, so we want to make sure that those are two lanes. And then we see that they're one way, which gets into the next category, which is these multi-lane one-way streets, which were laid across the US everywhere. Not everywhere, almost everywhere. Uh, starting in the 60s, probably finishing up in the 90s, although I, I know some cities right now are, are considering doing this, but it was DOTs, um, as particularly as they laid highways through city centers, they then turned the on and off ramps into one-way pairs. Here you killed the highway that was going to destroy your downtown, and congratulations on that, but you still got the one-way pairs that we find all over the U.S. We've now witnessed more than 100 projects across the U.S where these one-way pairs have been reverted back, restored back to their original two-way travel. And in any of these 100 projects, there's never been anything but delight at the outcome of that change. Old timers will tell you that when they were here and they saw the one-way, when the one-ways came in, all the shops that went out of business, the devastation that that brought to the city center. And now, whoops, whatever that was, I don't need it. Um, and now, uh, whenever we restore traffic, and I've worked on a bunch of them, back to this two-way pattern, the shops come back, the life comes back. Why? Why is this so unsafe? First of all, it looks like a highway. It feels like a highway, right? There's this momentum of all these vehicles traveling in the same direction. There's the opportunity to jockey. And I'm convinced that the opportunity to jockey is the most important thing psychologically because it turns you into a different type of driver where if you're like me, you want to be in the fastest lane, and it's always the lane that you're not in. Right? You stop shopping, you stop looking for a place to hang out, you know, you, your, your focus becomes road racer. If I, mine does. Not even, I'm not even in a hurry, it's just fun. It's fun to go faster. So, so um, the, the story that kind of started changing this was in, Van, was in Vancouver, Washington, in Governing Magazine in the 90s, no, in 2009, where Alan Ehrenholt, a well-known writer, talks about the return of the two-way street here in Vancouver, Washington, and how um, all they did was, they, they eventually convinced the DOT, all they did was flip that switch, and the number of cars per day on the street stayed constant, the revenues to the businesses doubled. And that's a similar experience that we found all over the place. This is downtown Cedar Rapids, where um, we took this system of half, half four lane one ways, and we reverted, we restored it to this system, that meant the parking went from this, where red is angle, to this, which of course the merchants love. The bike network went from this to this, because we had all this extra room in the street. And a typical street went from this to that. And now the downtown is, is much more walkable, much more safe. Louisville, Kentucky, not too far away. Brook and First Street. Brook, First, Second, and Third were all two-way streets. Brook and First were reverted to two-way. Second and third were kept as one way. On the two ways, crashes went down by 48% and crime went down by 23%. On the one ways, crashes went up 15% and crime went up 36%. And if you ask me later, I can tell you why crime went up, but moving right along. This is New Albany, Indiana, right, ac right across the river. You probably know it. This was our plan. We reverted the entire downtown back to two-way traffic. They sat on it for three years. They were scared to death. The police chief didn't like it. The fire chief didn't like it. Finally, one summer, they did it all in a month after neighbors complained and tried you know, for three years to make it happen. This is the police chief. I've never seen a better scenario for public safety. Speeds have been reduced, crashes are down, and response times to calls for service are far better than they've ever been. The guy who was fighting it. And when you have experiences like this in city after city, you, you can go with absolute confidence to places like Lexington and say, I know you should do this. Now you have an issue, I believe, you probably don't own all these streets. The state probably owns some of these streets. I heard some state DOT people were coming today. Are they here? All right, right there. I won't make you stand up. <laughs> if the state of Kentucky wishes to be beloved by the city of Lexington, they will support you. 
in this effort to, to return your travel to two-way. Uh, so, of course, you have limestone and upper. You have main and vine. You have Maxwell and high. You have short and second. Those are the main ones I saw. You also have streets like church. <clears throat> I'm not suggesting you change your one way, your one lane one ways back. It's the, some people get all confused, like, well, this seems like a safe street, but yeah, it's the multi-lane that's, the, multi that's the problem, okay? And they're all over the place, so that's that. Uh, next item in this category is the width of the lanes themselves. Andre Stuani used to show this slide, and he'd say, the typical road to the typical subdivision in the United States is now wide enough to allow you to witness the curvature of the earth. <laughs> and it's true. The standards have shifted. This is a subdivision from the 1960s. Look at the width of the street. Here's one from the 1980s. The standards, there's been this mission creep, so streets get wider and wider, and uh, we have to creep it back. People go faster on wider lanes, <coughs> well documented. Uh, uh, you know, a 10-foot lane in a city is a 35-mile-an-hour lane. A 12-foot lane is a highway lane. It's a 70-mile-an-hour lane. Yet a lot of cities have 12-foot lanes through them. Um, and then when you get into residential neighborhoods, of course, the kind of streets the lucky ones among us grew up on, you know, this is a, this is a new town that we built outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, you know, this is a two-way street. Uh, all you really need is about 12 feet of clear because, of course, you can pull over. In single-family neighborhoods, um, Vince Graham, who designed, the, who uh, developed this neighborhood um, in Charleston, he, he famously quotes this, uh, this philosopher who said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life. <laughs> and it's true. Um, so Portland had a skinny streets program. This is relevant here, and I'll show you why. Um, but this is in your residential neighborhoods. We only need about 12 feet clear for a two-way street. But for your urban streets, your New York City style streets, your, you know, your, your busy commercial streets, um, 10 feet is the standard. It used to be, and it needs to be again. Most, many cities are switching back. Look, two biggish vehicles, they fit just fine. In a seven foot parking lane, which is a foot narrow, they fit just fine, it's not a problem. Um, and you've got streets like Kentucky that should be 36 feet, 10, 8, 10, 10, 8, park, drive, drive, park, but are 41, right? A little extra five, five or six feet in there. Uh, I think this is South Main. Euclid, sorry. It's, thir it's three lanes and 36, so you've got an extra six feet there. Uh, East Main is uh, here, it's 60 feet, one, two, it's five lanes and 60 feet, or 58 feet. So you could have a parking lane there. If you had a parking lane there, you wouldn't need those barrels to protect you, right, on the edge of the street. Um, and then this section of MLK in the university, um, it's drive, drive, park. It should be 28, but it's 37. This section further up is drive, drive, and at no park, and it's 36. So this is an opportunity. You can add parking. You can mm -hmm. add biking. But... You, you can use up that asphalt with other things that get you down to that 10-foot width. And when we do a walkability study, that's the sort of thing that we do. We just restripe. Now, you have a couple residential streets, I noticed, really nice streets. We find this in a number of cities that are unnecessarily one way because they match this skinny street standard. I notice Bullock and Franklin and Hambrick that look like this, and they're one way. Well, in the best cities in America, the, the, the Charlestons and the Savannas and the everywhere, these are two-way streets. They're not one-way streets. And it says one way, and then someone had to put up a speed limit sign because people are speeding. It's just a suggestion. But if it were two-way, of course, there'd be that conflicting traffic. And uh, it's 28 feet, which is actually two feet more than the Portland skinny street that has two-way traffic and, and sporadic parking on both sides. So in Mobile, Alabama, for example, we're, we're turning these one ways into two way just with, by removing the do not enter signs. Next is signals. This is not a signal for a roundabout, it's a piece of art, but um, we are over signaled in America, vastly over signaled. Um, we are putting in the other thing we're doing, and if you think about it, you'll understand why. 
particularly when you revert two one-way systems back to two-way, and the intersections no longer have multiple lanes in each direction, you're able to replace signals with stop signs. Here's the study in Philadelphia. They replaced 472 signals with all-way, importantly, all-way stop signs. Crashes went down 24%. Injury crashes went down 63%. Severe pedestrian injury crashes down by 68%. And you think, I don't have time to explain it, but if you think about how you drive through stop signs, even if you roll through, versus how you drive through a green light or a yellow light, you understand why stop signs are so much safer than, than signals. People speeding up to beat the red, which apparently only happens in Philadelphia, according to these. <laughs> Um, but this is, you know, this is what I call the good city, you know. The bike has the right of way, the wheelchair user feels very comfortable. And anything you do, by the way, I don't talk about it much because we have ADA, but anything you do to make your city more rollable is going to make it more walkable and vice versa. And that's a real important thing to remember. Um, this is Albuquerque, New Mexico, where all the red, uh, I recommended turning 11 I recommended turning 17 intersections from signals to stop signs. They did it on 11, and there was a rebellion, and the, they put them back, they wrapped them and went back to the signals, and then there was a, another larger rebellion, and they went back to the stop signs. <laughs> because, because the citizens found, the drivers found, the stop signs allowed them to get through downtown faster. Think about that because they were never sitting waiting at a light. So it's a safety benefit, but it also is, a, is a, a convenience benefit. And I was just so thrilled to see this anachronism in Better Call Saul, which supposedly happens in the 1990s, uh, and they have one of our uh, new bike lanes uh, that we put in in 2015 <laughs> in Albuquerque as part of that study. Uh, parallel parking, an essential barrier of steel that protects the curb from moving vehicles. A lot of your streets are missing it. This is Fort Lauderdale, famous for its happy hour. Uh, left side of the street, they allow parking. This is happy hour on the left. Right side of the street, they don't allow parking. This is happy hour on the right. No one wants to sit or stand or walk within a few feet of cars going 30 miles an hour. It just feels horrible, and parallel parking solves that problem. The other part of the picture, of course, is street trees. People used to call them FHOs, engineers, fixed hazardous objects. You weren't allowed to put them near the street. Um, Virginia, they call them FHOs. Um, we've now seen the studies, there are actually fewer crashes, fewer injuries and deaths on streets that have, on segments of streets, the same street that have the trees, because people drive slower. Street trees slow you down, sometimes dramatically. But <laughs> better to hit a tree than a, than a pedestrian. Um, and of course, they pref you know, in perspective, they can really give you that sense of comfort on the sidewalk, because they set up a wall between you and the cars. This is a Dutch artist's interpretation of a street without trees, without parallel parking, uh, protecting the edge. And of course, you have a bunch of examples uh, where your parallel parking has been removed to allow more driving. Uh, and you know, buckets are attempting to <laughs> play the role of street trees and, uh, and parking. Bike lanes, you've got some. Some good ones right near here, right? The beautiful green one right outside. Um, Urban cycling is the current planning revolution currently underway in some American cities, and many not, and some much more than others. But what we're doing now almost exclusively is the protected bike lane, where you move, the park. what you're seeing there is a row of parked cars that have been moved off the curb, and then they're protecting the bike lane one way or two way. This is Pro Prospect Park West in New York City. When they protected the bike lane, the number of cyclists tripled, S sidewalk cycling dropped, speeding dropped, precipitously crashes went down. Just as many cars are getting through that street as before. They were just racing from red to red before. Nice example. Being New York City, of course, there was a protracted five-year lawsuit, but eventually the bike-hating NIMBY trolls grudgingly surrendered to reality. But I show this picture to contrast it with this picture. You know, nobody wants their daughter in the door zone. Just a dangerous place to be, um, not, not uh, a complete street. And I hear you have a complete streets ordinance here. It's important to get the details right. Just putting bike lanes in a street does not make it a complete street, particularly um, you know, if it's not protected. 
because people are always putting stuff in the bike lanes. This is, this is what happens in my neighborhood every trash day. Um, bigger trash, smaller trash. This is the Uber that comes to pick me up. It doesn't matter if there's 16 empty parking spaces, the Uber sits in the bike lane because it's not protected. I have all these pictures I collect of things in bike lanes. And of course, what you have to do when there's a policeman in the bike lane is go out and get yourself killed, swerving in front of traffic. Uh, this is a little ironic. <laughs> I guess it's biking, biking in the bike lane. But uh, the, the basic lesson is you have to protect the, the bike lane. So, you know, <clears throat> I would say that a, on a street as wide as Euclid, um, a buffer alone isn't enough, right? When you've got three 11 foot lanes, which is what's there, um, this is not a street that's going to invite a, a shy cyclist, right? It only, only invites confident cyclists. You need, you need non aggressive cyclists. Um, to cycle to get a real biking population and the protected lane is the way to do it. The new standard, which we're finally doing now, which they were doing in Europe in the 1990s, is up on the sidewalk edge. And when we build a new bike lane in Boston, this is how we do it. Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Newton, now where I'm working, um, these are, this is the new standard, up on the sidewalk edge, um, like that. And that's the way to do it. Separate it from the pedestrian so there's no confusion. Um, I'm not going to get into that image. It's a project I did in Indiana. Um, the Shero, we've learned, this is a particular heinous <laughs> example. Uh, the Shero, we've learned, actually makes streets more dangerous. Sharrows are, are not effective. Um, share the road, you may as well say, share the ocean. <laughs> and um, I asked, I went out on Twitter and I asked my followers to come up with a new Shero symbol based on that new study that, that told us, and the, 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 this was not the winner, that was the runner up. The winner was the Prero. <laughs> Please don't hit me. Um, so, you know, for many people, this is the image of the cyclist that they have in mind, the mammal, the middle-aged male in Lycra. But in fact, in your city, this is more likely the cyclist, or statistically, this is your cyclist. It's a restaurant worker, it's a hotel worker. Um, fully, 38.5% of your people who cycle to work are from your lowest 25% of income earners. So actually, an investment in bike infrastructure is an investment in equity and it's helping out those who need the help the most. So we recommend that. Now, the last two categories are quick, so I am nearing the end of my slightly overtime talk. Um, the comfortable walk is a little counterintuitive. Um, we all like climbing mountains and seeing wide open spaces, but actually, we also like to feel enclosed. And the evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals, humans among them, are simultaneously seeking prospect and refuge. You want to see your predators before they get you, and, but you need to feel that your flanks are covered from attack. And if your flanks don't feel covered, you don't feel safe. And so the height to width ratio is super important. And as designers, we try to make outdoor living rooms. You know, a plaza is only as good as its edges. A street is only as good as its street walls. The ratio is really important. If you get too wide, you have to go higher or else you no longer feel enclosed on a street. One to one is the Renaissance ideal. It's the, it's the rule in Washington, D.C. and many other cities um, where the height of the buildings corresponds to the width of the streets. But, you know, six to one can be great. This is Salzburg. The opposite of Salzburg, of course, is Houston. Um, <laughs> but this is Houston in the 90s. Houston is doing so much better now, particularly this neighborhood. But I show this slide to remind us that it's the surface parking lot that's typically the villain in this conversation. Uh, of course, trees uh, are another great way to neck down a space and make it feel comfortable. And then there's the climatic, climactic, climatic uh, aspect of trees as well uh, that is so important uh, to making street spaces comfortable. And, you know, this is a new square that's coming in. This is a site we're going to be talking about in a minute, which is the Lexington cut stone and tile site that's under development. But on the corner, caddy corner to it is this lovely, beautiful design square, but someone forgot what a square is. Actually, I see some tiny trees. Maybe they're going to grow, but they look like little bushes that probably aren't trees, right? That is not a square. This is a square. A square is defined by having shade and trees all along its edge that enclose it, protect it, make it feel safe, and make it comfortable when the sun is out. And so your ordinances or your designers need to understand that and typically, the architect wants them, and someone pulls it out along the way. But, but 
Without trees along the edge, you're not going to get a great public space. Um, and your downtown is starkly lacking in trees. And I should say, that's not unusual. You shouldn't feel bad about it. But for a place that grows trees so easily and robustly, there's no reason why you shouldn't be making the investment in more trees. I hope your city has a standard where, and not that many cities do, but more are, more are doing this, that you can't rebuild a sidewalk without putting trees in 30 feet on center or tighter. You can't build a new street in a subdivision without putting trees in 30 feet on center. You know, that used to be standard. All the best neighborhoods have trees. All the worst don't. It's really hard to find an, a bad neighborhood with trees because of what they contribute to, to quality of a place. Now, in this comfortable category, I was looking for new urbanist stuff. There's a wonderful new urbanist development that my old firm did um, in Louisville called Norton Commons. Has anyone been there? It's, I think it turned out really well. I didn't work on it, so I can say it's great. Um, I found this interesting development from, from the Google Air that's just west of your downtown. Clearly, someone is following the new urbanist playbook. There are pedestrian streets. Uh, there are alleys. Um, this is, here's a pedestrian street. Um, there's a nice block structure. A couple of things I want to point out. One, this is Beacon Street. No, this is Beacon Street, where I live, but this is Beacon Street. It's an alley. It's actually at the backs of the houses that face the, um, the pedestrian street. It's been designed as a street. This is, this is a typical new urbanist project that I worked on called Kentlands. This is what an alley should be, 12 feet of pavement in a 24-foot right-of-way. Someone is requiring your developer, I'm sure he didn't want to or she didn't want to, to build your alleys as streets. We're just going to bankrupt these projects and not make them successful. An alley needs to be wide enough to get the fire truck through, right? but it does not need to be designed as a street. It makes these projects non-viable. That's the first thing I noticed. The second thing I noticed was that as you get towards the center of this, oh, no wonder this is, no, there we go. As you get to the center of this neighborhood, you see there, people forgot about this idea of lining the buildings with streets. And they have front parking lots. And the buildings are floating in a sea of parking. So you no longer have that condition of feeling enclosed on the street. It becomes sociofugal. You wish to flee it. And so it's really important in any development to not allow, and a lot of cities do have this rule, just don't allow parking between a sidewalk and a building front. Or you end up with an uncomfortable space. So that's something I noticed there. There's some really nice proposals in the Nicholsville, Nicholsville? Nichols, Nicholsville Drive um, uh, plan. Uh, the first thing is a prototypical form-based code. We don't need to talk at length about what a form-based code is, except to say that more and more hundreds of cities are adopting them. And it would be really great for Lexington to have one as well. Um, and your city staff understands that. Secondly are a couple really cool proposals. This one for the Fayette Mall. I just want to point out one thing, though, which is a flaw I find in a lot of these plans. You've got a wonderful main street here and other great streets. I'm sure you've got a nice internal walk in the mall. This little gap is enough to kill this whole project. This is only about 200, well, it's about 150 feet of no man's land. All you need to do is neck, I'm sorry, you can't all see this from over there. I'll, I'll shine, oh, I can't shine on those screens. Between the mall's west end and the main street, there's just a gap. And you often find these in these projects, but people will not walk across those gaps. So filling them in, just filling them in with a little bit of building lining the street there would make a big difference. Just wanted to point that out. Otherwise, a truly excellent plan. And then, um, I'll talk about this one in a minute. Um, so that's the comfortable walk. And then finally, the interesting walk is just about being entertained and seeing signs of life and signs of variety. We humans are among the social primates. Nothing interests us more than other humans. We want to see other people around. But if not, we want, we want evidence that other people are around. Doors, windows, no blank walls, um, that sort of thing. I mentioned that one-to-one -one was the Renaissance ideal for a street space. This is a one-to-one -one street space in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids has a very walkable downtown, but no one wants to walk on this street, which importantly connects the two main hotels downtown. Because you know, when one, one side of the street is a parking garage, and the other side is a conference facility, apparently designed in admiration for that parking garage, <laughs> um, it's just boring. Nobody wants to be bored by long, horizontal repetition of the same thing. 
um, or just blank parking structures against the street. This is in Charleston where we learn that it only takes 25 feet of building to hide 250 feet of parking, right? That thin edge, that thin crust of inhabited building is all you need to hide your parking decks uh, from the street. This is another one in Miami I call the Chia Pet Garage. Um, <laughs> but it's got shops at the ground floor and then foliage up above. Um, this image you probably recognize. It's your version of this image. Um, but the, you know, the blank wall is, luckily students will walk in almost any environment, right? <laughs> But non-students will be less likely to walk down this street. Um, and you have a nice collection of, of unhidden parking decks. So you need to make that rule here. If you're going to build any more parking decks, push them back 25 or even ideally 40 feet and have a single loaded corridor apartment house up against them or something else between them and the street. And then what I want to mention in this other, you know, again, excellent plan. I'm not trying to make enemies, but I want to point out that at the South Park Shopping Center proposal, this excellent Main Street running through has two parking decks right up against it and is putting a liner against Nicholsville Road, which is entirely unwalkable by design. No one's going to be walking on Nicholsville, Nicholsville Road, but everyone's going to be walking on this street. So you need to flip that line of apartments that I talked about. That's the crust. You need to flip that from the north side to the south side where the actual humans are walking and not just driving. So just one example. Uh, oh, sorry, there it is zoomed in. But you can see the crust, is on the, wrong, the crust is on the wrong side. The crust should be where the people are, not against the highway, with six crashes, no, crash every six hours. Um, and then I wanted to show you one, I couldn't help myself, and I redesigned a proposal that's, <laughs> that's in, happening. This is, this is um, the Lexington cut stone and brick. Marble, cut marble and something uh, site. It's across from a pretty cool mixed-use building on the other side of the road. That square I showed you that just needs trees is right over there. Um, and it's this site on the bottom of the slide. Stone, cut stone and tile. And you can see it's, I apologize again to you guys who maybe can't see with the angle, but what you see here is a pull in, I'm going, to turn it, I'm going to turn it over so the street's now at the bottom. You pull in off the street, there's retail here and retail there and access to apartments upstairs, a little more retail on the corner, but look, all of this on the ground floor is parking. So what the developer's done, <coughs> which is also very expensive, is he or she has put the parking in the building and then built on top of it. Right, which is, which is the most expensive way, aside from going underground, is the most expensive way to build parking. And the street edge, this whole way, you're walking past what's probably a nice wall with some window holes in it, but you're walking past nothing. You're walking past a dead blank parking wall. Yes, there are apartments above, but there's nothing at, at your level. So, and then there's a lot here. There's a building on top of this parking as well. What? What, whatever I do, what, what, whenever I'm handed a plan like this, I ask myself, okay, how good is it? Is it all right? But then, okay, what would I do if it were my plan? And here's what I would do. And what I would do, because I had some time Sunday, <laughs> is I would take all the parking, which is underneath the buildings, and consolidate it in a taller deck, since you're, you're building parking anyway. I would consolidate in a taller deck, however many levels you need, three or four, on this end of the property. I'd keep the flat ground level parking that's in the back. Notice the old scheme has this row of parking along the back. I'd keep it there. But I would replace this building with an actual deck and push it back. Now you have a building here that no longer has any parking at ground level. You have a U-shaped or a H, reverse H-shaped building here that has no parking at, it, at, um, at ground level. You have a, a nice courtyard here with a fountain. You have complete you can have stoops and doors and windows and you know Jane Jacobs life spilling out onto the sidewalk along the whole front of the building yes the people who live here they might have a little bit of a longer walk to parking but guess what they'll pay more for that because it'll be so delightful and wonderful to be in this place I put my name on it here's why this is free to whoever's developing this <laughs> but there are still a million ways to screw this up so if you want to use it oh is it you wow 
I didn't think that the, I didn't think the developer would show up. Um, if you want to use this, you have to talk to me because there's still a lot that could go wrong. But anyway, uh, oh, and then I also took all the mailboxes and made a little meeting hall and put them in here. So you have this entry green that's now longer, terminates on a civic space that can have like a temple front, and then you have the lobbies of the building in these locations. But this would be a great spot for retail. You could have more retail along the front um, and then guest parking in the back. Anyway, it was a first stab on a site I'd never been to. Now the developers here, I'm really worried. Um, <laughs> But the point is, the parking doesn't have to be at the ground level near the street. Um, so there's that. There here are the two schemes <coughs> side by side. Uh, so that's everything. And uh, you need to do all four things. You can't, you can't just do th two or three, or you won't, you won't convince people to make the walk. I want to say, you know, this is where people say, but we're not the Netherlands. <laughs> And the point I like to make when people think that, even if they don't say it, is that in the 70s, early 80s, the Netherlands was not the Netherlands. It was Holland, and it was completely like the US, overrun with traffic. They'd been, a, it's true, they'd been a, more of a cycling culture, but they weren't so much at this point. Um, they had the Stop Their Kindermord campaign when 500 children died in one year. They created Vision Zero, they did it properly. They changed their engineering standards, which we still haven't done here. Um, within 15 years, they got it down to nine children dying in a year, from 500 to nine. Um, and they took it really seriously. And so what's at the top became what's at the bottom. This street became that street. This street became that street. You know, multiply that by a whole country. But the point is, it's possible. Yes, it takes time. It takes maybe a generation to make these changes. There are a number of American cities that are, that are committed to making these changes, and uh, I hope that you will join me in, in my commitment to see this happen here. Um, and that's my message. Don't clap yet. I'd like to share some resources with you um, that will be constantly available. As you know, I'll, I might, when this is over, by the way, I will run to the, oh, there'll be a little Q&A if there's time, but then I'm gonna run to the book table so I can meet you there, but I'll be signing books out back. Walkable City really is kind of the gateway drug into this conversation. Um, I'll talk about the other books, but certainly for, com for either entertaining yourself on the beach, summer's coming, or um, to convince other people of this stuff, Walkable City is the most useful book. Um, it now has the 10th anniversary edition with 100 new pages of new things that have happened in the last decade. If you're doing this work, if you're a developer or a uh, activist or a planner, this is the book that's much more detailed, practical, and has charts and tables and graphs and uh, instruction, walkable city rules. Each, it's 101 steps to making better places. Each two pages is a rule, like replace signals with always stops. You may recognize that image. Um, smart Growth Manual, if you want to see our take on smart growth, since this is a smart growth session. Um, and then the TED Talks were already sent your way. I hope you'll show those to people who don't want to spend any real time on this. <laughs> and then, um, it's actually, people are signing up right now. It's not too late for me to tell you that, that June 15th through 16th, I'm teaching a class at Harvard um, that's two days long. It's not cheap, because it's Harvard. When the two days are over, you get a diploma that looks like you graduated from Harvard. <laughs> so a lot of people have, have found it to be a good value. Um, and uh, all these resources and more are at my website, which is jeffspeck.com, which I, well, anyway, it's myname.com, uh, and you can find more there. And now I think I'm done, yes. So thank you.